Welcome to the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UC, uh, UCY. That's UCY TV. I'm used to being on UCY.TV. So I want to thank all the listeners on Real Liberty Media, and I want to thank Vince and Grimner for putting up with me. And uh, I really appreciate uh, being live on the air with all of you. And I hope today's uh, show is going better than it did last week. <laughs> and I really want to thank everyone for hanging in there on that um, conversation we had about not just Helen Caldecott's documents that she read, but also on, uh, I guess, our political differences. After last week's show on Real Liberty Media, I wrote Vince and said, do you guys still want me? Because obviously, politically, I'm not I'm not the same. So, But, you know, this is America and we do value diversity in all its forms. So I am very grateful to be here with all of you. Today I have with us, I don't have an interview today, but there are several articles I definitely want to uh, highlight and read portions of. I don't know if I'll read all of it, but after last week's show, in order for me to produce my show for the Spreaker podcast and uh, KEPW, I had to put together different articles so it could be more cohesive. And I found an article on nuclear-news.net. And that's a, it's a really great little website that I would recommend everybody go to. It's nuclear-news.net. And Christina McPherson, Sean McGee, and... Uh, I think his name is Don Renard. He's a Frenchman. They post articles. And Christina found this. She created an article from a book, basically. The title of the book is called, let me go to the bottom of the thing. It's called Nuclear Darkness. And this article is completely fascinating. Um, The title of it says, War Planners Ignore the Fire Effect of Nuclear Bombing. And if you, I thought it was timely this week since we had the lunatic in the White House threatening war on everyone. And, uh, you know, in the back of all of our minds right now, we are thinking about nuclear war. We can't help but think about it. If we go to war with Iran, it is not going to be a conventional war. Well, we don't have conventional wars anymore. We have depleted uranium wars, which is nuclear war. You know, the United States, I think it was 2008, changed its army manual to say that depleted uraniums are perfectly fine with us, even though the rest of the world considers them as nuclear weapons and illegal to sell. The United States now supplies our so-called friends with depleted uranium weapons, which is basically a nuclear weapon, and it is catastrophic. You can look into what happened at Fallujah to see exactly what happened to those people. Essentially, the people in Fallujah are being told don't have babies for at least two to three generations. So that's basically genocide. You know, you're asking someone, their great-grandchildren, to, if your grandchildren are alive today, that their kids can't have kids? Like, what does that mean, don't have kids? So we are in a hard, hard pickle right now because most of us, myself included, literally took for granted that the United States military was looking after the interests and the health and public safety of people on the planet. We knew, I knew, that they were growing into the largest military force on the planet, but who would think that they would be run by a bunch of suicidal, genocidal maniacs? I don't know. 
I mean, I guess it's kind of like right now in our country, we're watching the GOP literally manhandle and pummel to death our Constitution. Like, by the end of the Trump presidency, if it ends in 12 years like he said it would, um, you know, will we have a Constitution? I know, I hear people on the other end of this saying, we don't have a Constitution. We do have a Constitution, we just don't have participation. We have 100 million people. It wasn't 10 million. We have 100 million non-voters, as a matter of a fact. The 10 million was an incorrect number. There's 100 million non-voters in this country that are eligible to vote. That's a shocking amount of people. This is precisely why we don't have democracy. We have 100 million people just like swinging in the wind going, yeah, it's not working. Let's just keep getting beat up. Imagine if we had a hundred million people calling their con- congressman's office. I mean, the Republicans have already disconnected their phone numbers. So you can't contact your congressman in their district. You have to write him an email because they don't want to hear about you. Let me get to this article. It's called City on Fire, Nuclear Darkness by Lynn Eden. Uh, and let me, hold on, I'm going to send Grimner a little message. Uh... Let me see. Am I on? Okay. I'm sending our producer a little message. I'm going to continue with the idea that we I am okay because I haven't heard anybody texting me or freaking out that I'm not live. So, But I wanted to read this article to you because it is completely compelling. And it really un- it underscores the necessity for absolutely saying no to nuclear weapons. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And Grivner just confirmed that I sound great. That's awesome. And my computer just did something really weird. (laughs) It put all the stories in like one big gigantic place. Okay, here we go. Let's do this again. I don't understand this split screen thing that goes on with these computers. So here we go. City on Fire, Nuclear Darkness by Lynn Eden, L-Y-N-N-E. E-D-E-N. And this was posted on NuclearNews.net. That's Nuclear-News.net on December 30th, 2019. By ignoring the fire damage that would result from a nuclear attack and taking into account blast damage alone, U.S. war planners were able to demand a far larger nuclear arsenal than necessary. For more than 50 years, The U.S. government has seriously underestimated damage from nuclear attacks. The earliest schemes to predict damage from atomic bombs, devised in 1947 and 48, focused only on blast damage and ignored damage from fire, which can be far more devastating than blast effects. The failure to include damage from fire in nuclear war plans continues today. Because fire damage has been ignored for the past half century, high-level U.S. decision makers have been poorly informed, if informed at all, about the extent of damage that nuclear weapons would actually cause. As a result, any U.S. decision to use nuclear weapons almost certainly would be predicated on insufficient and misleading information. If nuclear weapons were used, the physical, social, and political effects could be far more destructive than anticipated. How can this systematic failure to assess fire damage have persisted for more than a half a century? The most common response is that fire damage from nuclear weapons is inherently less predictable than blast damage. This is untrue. Nuclear fire damage is just as predictable as blast damage. Wait till you hear this story, you guys. This is shocking like we think we understand what happens but it it is beyond comprehension to visualize the destructiveness of a nuclear bomb imagine a powerful strategic nuclear weapon detonated above the pentagon a short distance from the center of washington dc imagine it as a near surface burst about 1500 feet above the ground which is how a military planner might choose to wreak blast damage on a massive structure like the Pentagon. Let us say that it is an ordinary 
clear day with visibility at 10 miles and the weapon's explosive power is 300 kilotons, the approximate yield of most modern day nuclear strategic weapons. This would be far more destructive than the 15 kilobomb, kiloton bomb detonated at Hiroshima or the 21 kiloton bomb detonated at Nagasaki. So we're talking about today's bombs are 300 kilotons as compared to 15 or 21. The only two bombs we've ever seen really detonated. Washington, D.C. has long been the favorite hypothetical target, but a single bomb detonated over a capital city is probably not a realistic planning assumption. When a former commander-in-chief of the U.S. Strategic Command read my scenario, he, knew, he wanted to know why I only put one bomb on Washington. We must have targeted Moscow with 400 weapons, he said. He explained the military logic of planning a nuclear attack on Washington, D.C. You'd put one on the White House, one on the Capitol, several on the Pentagon, several on the National Airport, one on the CIA. I can think of 50 to 100 targets right off. I would be comfortable saying that there is, there would be several dozen weapons aimed at D.C. Moreover, he said that even today with fewer weapons, that makes sense would be decapitating strike for those who command the military forces. Today, he said, Washington is no less in danger than during the Cold War. Dang. And probably way more now. <laughs> the discussion that follows greatly understated the damage that would occur in a concerted nuclear at attack. And not only because I described the effects of a single weapon, I describe what would happen to the humans in the area, but I do not concentrate on injury, the tragedy of lives lost, or the unspeakable loss of, the ca of its capital city. These are important, but I am concerned about how organizations estimate and underestimate nuclear weapons damage. Thus, I focus largely, as, I, as they do, on the physical environment and the physical damage to structures. With this in mind, let us look at some of the consequences of a nuclear weapon detonation from the first infraction of a second to the utter destruction from blast and fire that would happen within several hours. This will allow us to understand the magnitude of the damage of both effects, but particularly from fire, which is neither widely understood nor accounted for in the damage prediction in the nuclear war, U.S. nuclear war plans. I mean... And Donald Trump has repeatedly asked to drop the nuclear weapons. You know, he's itching to be the president who drops the bomb. That's what he wants his legacy to be. That's why he has instigated this thing with Iran. He really, really, I predict that when the facts come out about his criminality, within hours we will see a nuclear weapon detonated. He is not going to leave peacefully. He is a violent, malignant domestic abuser. Back to the story. The detonation of a 300 kiloton nuclear bomb would release an extraordinary amount of energy in an instant, about 300 trillion calories within a millionth of a second. More than 95% of the energy initially released would be in the form of an intense light. This light would be absorbed by the air around the weapon. <clears throat> this light would be absorbed by the air around the weapon superheating the air to very high temperatures and creating a ball of intense heat, a fireball. Because this fireball would be so hot, it would expand rapidly. Almost all of the air that originally occupied the volume within and around the fireball would be compressed into a thin shell of superheated glowing high-pressure gas. The shell of a gas would compress the surrounding air, forming a steeply fronted luminous shock wave of enormous extent and power, the blast wave. By the time the fireball approached its maximum size, it would be more than a mile in diameter. A fireball, a mile in diameter, you guys. It would, be, it would very briefly produce temperatures at its center of more than 200 million degrees Fahrenheit for about four to five Five time, or about four to five times the temperature at the center of the sun. Wow. 
The release of light and heat would create an environment of almost unimaginable lethality. Vast amounts of thermal energy would ignite extensive fires over urban and suburban areas. In addition, the blast wave and high-speed winds would crush many structures and tear them apart. The blast would also boost the incidence and rate of fire spread by exploding ignitable surfaces, releasing flammable materials and dispersing burning materials. Can you imagine what would happen when a nuclear blast hits, say, uh, a nuclear power facility like in New York, Indian Point, or any of the nuclear power facilities? Lord. Within minutes of a detonation, fire would be everywhere. Numerous fires and firebrands firebrands burning material would set more fires, would coalesce into a mass fire. Scientists prefer this term to firestorm, but I will use them interchangeably here. This fire would engulf tens of square miles and begin to heat enormous volumes of air that would rise, while cool air from the fire's periphery would be pulled in. Within 10 minutes of, after the detonation, the pumping action of rising hot air would generate superheated ground winds of hurricane forces, further intensifying the fire. Virtually no one in an area of about 40 to 65 square miles would survive. A little farther away, within minutes of detonation, a fire would be everywhere. Numerous fires and firebrands burning material would set more fires, would coalesce into a mass fire. Hey, we just read that. So I guess that they repeated this twice. <laughs> she put this in the article two times, Christina did, because I guess it's really intense. <clears throat> Okay, and then we come into this article on NuclearNews.net. And I want to thank you guys for listening to me. You're listening to Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. And I'm reading an article on nuclear news, Nuclear-News.net. And war planners ignore the fire effects of nuclear bombing. And it was posted on December 31st, 2019. A Hurricane of Fire. This is the new subtitle. The first indicator of a mass fire would be strangely shifting ground winds of growing intensity near ground zero. Such winds would be entirely different from and unrelated to the earlier blast wave that would exert drag pressure on structures. These fire winds are a physical consequence of the rise of heated air over large areas of ground surface, much like a gigantic bonfire. The inrushing winds would drive the flames from combusting buildings horizontally towards the ground, filling city streets with hot flames and firebrands, breaking in doors and windows, and causing the fire to jump hundreds of feet to swallow anything that has not yet violently been combusted. These extraordinary winds would transform the targeted area into a hurricane of fire. A hurricane of fire. Imagine that, you guys. Within 10 minutes, everything within approximately 3.5 to 4.6 miles of the Pentagon would be engulfed in a mass fire. The fire would extinguish all life and destroy almost everything else. I guess so. 300 billion degrees? Like, that's outrageous. Firestorm physics. This description of the physics of a mass firestorm is based on the work of a few scientists who have examined in detail the damaging effects of nuclear weapons, including nuclear engineer Theodore A. Postol and physicist Harold Brody. Postol is one of the country's leading non-government funded technical experts on nuclear weapons, missiles, and arms control. Brody's five-decade career has been devoted to the study of nuclear weapons effects. That mass fires have occurred and that something like the firestorm described here could occur is not in dispute. What is not widely accepted is that the nuclear weapons detonated in urban or suburban areas would be virtually certain to set mass fires and that the resulting damage is as predictable as blast damage. The much more widely held view is that the probability and range of mass fire depends on many unpredictable environmental variables 
including rain, snow, humidity, temperature, time of year, visibility, and wind conditions. But the work of Pistol, Brody, and Brody's collaborators show that the, ma the mass fire creates its own environment. Except in extreme cases, environmental factors do not affect the likelihood of a mass fire. Weather can affect the fire's range, but this can be reasonably well predicted. For nuclear weapons of approximately 100 kilotons or more, the range of destruction from mass fire will generally be substantially greater than from the blast. The extraordinary high air temperature and wind speeds uh, characteristic of a mass fire are the inevitable physical consequences of many simultaneous ignitions occurring over a vast area. The vacuum created by buoyantly rising air follows from the basic physics of combustion and fluid flow hydro or fluid dynamics. As the area of, area of the fire increases, so does the volume of rising air over the fire zone, causing, causing even more air to be sucked in to the, from the periphery of the fire at an increasingly higher speed. Only a few mass fires have occurred in human history. Those created by the British and U.S. conventional incendiary weapons and by U.S. atomic bombs in World War II. These include fires that destroyed Hamburg, Dresden, Kassel, Darmstadt, and Stuttgart in Germany, and Tokyo, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki in Japan. History's first mass fire began on the night of July 27, 1943, in Hamburg, created by Allied incendiary raids. Within 20 minutes, two-thirds of the buildings within an area of 4.5 square miles were on fire. It took fewer than six hours for the fire to completely burn an area of more than five square miles. Damage analysts called it a dead city. Wind speeds were of hurricane forces. Air temperatures were 500, 400 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Between 60,000 and 100,000 people were killed in that attack. A mass fire from a modern nuclear bomb could be expected to destroy a considerably larger urban or suburban area in a similarly short time. The unique features of the mass fire fundamentally distinguish it from the more slowly propagating line fire. Fire environments created by mass fires are fundamentally more violent and destructive than smaller scale fires, and they are far less affected than external by external weather conditions. They are not substantially altered by seasonal or weather daily weather conditions. Average air temperatures in the burning areas after the attack would be well above the boiling point of water. Winds generated by the fire would be hurricane force and the fire would burn everywhere at this intensely intensity for three to six hours. Even after the fire burned out, street pavement would be so hot that e even tracked vehicles could not pass over it for days, and buried, unburned material from collapsed buildings would burst into flames if exposed to air even weeks after the fire. Those who sought shelter in basements of strongly constructed buildings could be poisoned by carbon monoxide seeping in or killed by the oven-like conditions. Those who tried to escape through the streets would be incinerated by the hurricane force winds laden with firebrands and flames. Even those able to find shelter in the lower sub-basements of mass buildings would likely die of eventual heat prostration, poisoning from fire-generated gas or even lack of water the firestorm would eliminate all life in the fire zone. And this says, all publication data from the whole world on fire by Lynn Eden at Google. So I guess you can find it at Google and there's a link there. So I really wanted to share that with you, especially after last week's uh, discussion with uh, Helen Caldicott about the necessity of not going to war, of refusing to... I mean, participate in the silencing of the masses of people. I mean, it, I know that there's many people who think it doesn't matter what we do, but it does matter. 
because the politicians really are afraid of us. And right now we have the Space Force that really could care less about us. They have taken over. That's what this whole thing that the Trumpster is really highlighting is that it doesn't matter. Not a single human being on this planet matters over their plans for greed and avarice. I mean, for real, we are at the end of the bottom line. However, I think if people understood the gravity that they could not be safe, there is no place for them to go if they start a nuclear weapon, a, a nuclear war. And it is beyond comprehension that people even think that that is a viable alternative. With Trump saying that we should drop nuclear bombs on people, it's like, I've read several articles where he's like, well, why can't we just nuke them? Why can't we? I mean, this is... The guy has absolutely, he's a danger in terms of being president of the United States. He's a complete danger to the entire planet because he has absolutely no comprehension. He's got the lowest intellect of anybody to ever hit the White House, even lower than George W. Bush. I mean, at least Shrub understood the gravity of some of the things he was doing. This lunatic, he takes delight in it. He's literally a violent domestic abuser really frightening and you know what I say I just refuse to be afraid I'm not going to let them scare me but I will get active and I am going to bother my elected officials I mean I am going to go after them and tell them exactly what I think whether they I mean obviously we can look around look at all the look at all the newspaper articles that have been written about nuclear contamination Look at all the little organizations all around the country, NEARS, Beyond Nuclear, San Onofre Safety, Mothers Against War. I mean, there's just truckloads of them popped. Uh, The women in St. Louis. I mean, imagine living in St. Louis knowing that you were living right next door to a nuclear dump site and it is poisoning your children and the government will not relocate you. And is not really, you know, doing that much. They put a cap on the top of the leak. But, you know, there's many days if you go to the Facebook page of um, Just Moms STL and there's women holding their nose like that. They're holding their nose with pictures because evidently on some days around the leaking nuclear site in, in, um, in, at the Westlake Landfill, it smells like rotten eggs. It smells so bad. I mean, nuclear stuff doesn't smell, but what does smell is other chemicals and contamination that leaks out along with the, you know, the nuclear contamination that you can't see, taste, touch, or feel. I mean, it's actually a real shock. Over the last weekend, I drove down to, uh, I live in Eugene, Oregon, and I drove, it was like an 18-hour drive, honestly. I drove from Eugene to Oceanside to visit my sister who is dying of cancer. And uh, she was diagnosed with colon cancer on Thanksgiving. They gave her her first chemo treatment three days before Christmas, and she's taken a nosedive uh, and really does not have more than a day or two to live. So I drove down there to go see my sister. But she was right in Oceanside, 20 miles away from the leaking nuclear power plant, San Onofre nuclear power plant, which, yes, is closed down. But the canisters, they have over 100 canisters there that are leaking. Some of them are known to be leaking. The the freeway right next to the nuclear power facility, the 405 freeway at San Onofre is so radioactive that the Navy will not take the land back. And so you dr- when I drove down there, it was so weird because <clears throat> in front of my sister's uh, little house that she has was her neighbor had an orange tree. And I picked an orange, and afterwards I thought, what am I doing? I'm not eating this orange. Especially oranges. Oranges are very absorbent. They are not, you don't want to eat an orange growing in a nuclear area, that's for sure. But you couldn't taste it. I mean, San Diego is beautiful. It looked just like it did 30 years ago when I lived down there. Blue skies, you couldn't smell it, you couldn't taste it, you couldn't feel it. And there's probably just, it's probably not everywhere. It's probably like hot spots because it's downwind. This is the situation that millions of Americans live in right now. 
And our obligation is to learn how to live with it and not be freaked out about it. Like, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, you want to know what I do is I take a lot of vitamin C, 10 to 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. There's a really great book. It's an online book called Primal Panacea by Dr. Levy. He wrote this book because he believes that vitamin C is a cure to heart disease. Uh, and he talks about how the AMA has absolutely no interest in healing anyone. They are not interested in healing you. So your heart medications, that's not going to heal you. It's going to cover up the symptoms. <clears throat> so, But I do do that, and I take a half a teaspoon of baking soda every day. And I wouldn't say I do it seven days a week, but probably five days a week. I do do the vitamin C every single day. There's things that we can do for our bodies. Avoid sugar as much as you can. Sugar is a cancer magnet, although... If you're exposed to radioactivity on the regular, if you're an adult, you, you know, it will likely be manifested in your children. Your children become sterile. They have autoimmune diseases. They have diabetes, cancer, schizophrenia, autism. These are all symptoms of exposure to low-level radioactive contamination, which we have a plethora of in this nation right now. In fact, worldwide we're seeing an outbreak of it and no one wants to discuss the scientific information that John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin proved in their scientific studies for 10 years when they were hired by the U.S. government to figure out what to do with this nuclear waste. What they discovered is that it is 100% detrimental to the human body. No if ands, or buts. There's nothing good about it. And so people say, well, we have radioactive medicine now. Well, no. Those people that usually get the radiation treatment, five to ten years later, they're dead. So it might give you a little bit extension of life, but it's not a cure for cancer. And there are cures for cancer. I have seen people be cured of cancer. I've known people who have survived it. But you know how they did it? By juicing by refusing to eat chemicals and really intensely juicing and taking high levels of vitamin C and giving your body what it needs to fight off whatever it is that's causing your system to fail. So let me see where we're at with the time. Let's see. Yeah, we're halfway through. So you've been listening to Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. I want to thank my listeners for uh, coming to this program and listening uh, we're live now on Real Liberty Media, and you can join us there and live stream from Real Liberty Media. Real Liberty Media is also on Twitter and also on Facebook, I believe. I see them on Twitter. That's actually where I get my news feeds is I go to the Twitter feeds and click through the links and find it that way. I'm kind of a Twitter hound now that uh, the trader has shoved us. I can't wait for his tax returns to come out because I have a... I'll bet a million bucks he has huge investments in Twitter. (laughs) I bet he bought big time into Twitter in 2016. (laughs) That's why he does his foreign policy and his domestic policy on Twitter in the middle of the night while he's stuffing his face with potato chips. (laughs) You know what's really astonishing about what's going on in our nation, though? It's like this nuclear industry. What about all the people in this industry, all the liars, all the people supporting the lies, all the scientists who actually know the truth? They know the facts. They know that they are doing everything they can to mislead the public, and yet they continue to do it. They have absolutely no idea how to stop the fission, the process of fission that's going on at Fukushima or at Sellafield or even at um, Hanford where they're delaying and delaying figuring out what to do with the waste. I mean, Donald Trump recently reclassified 100 million gallons of high-level radioactive waste into low-level radioactive waste so they could save money in storing it. It's beyond, it's, honestly, it is really beyond comprehension. What I really want to do right now, though, I see we're at just about 38 minutes, is I want to read to you a poem from The Way of Life from Lao Tzu. And for those of you who don't know, Lao Tzu was born, what do they say? Well, I'll just read it right from this book. This is a translation by Witter Biner. 
his book of poetry called The Way of Life. Uh, it says, Legends as to Lao Tzu are more or less familiar. Immaculately conceived to a shooting star, carried in his mother's womb for 62 years, and born, it is said, white-haired in 604 B.C., he became in due time keeper of imperial archives in Luoyang, an ancient capital that is now the Chinese province of Honan. So that's pretty interesting. They thought he was born. Legend has it that he was born 65 years old with white hair. <clears throat> so how old was his mother <laughs> when he was born? I don't ever think about that one. <laughs> Okay, here's number eight. I really love this poem, and the reason I'm sharing this is so we can get some of our humanity back. Man at his best, like water, serves as he goes along. Like water, he seeks his own level, the common level of life, loves living close to the earth, living clear down in his heart, loves kinship with his neighbors, the pick of words that tell the truth, the even tenor of a well-run state the fair profit of able dealing, the right timing of useful deeds, and for blocking no one's way, no one blames him. Remember that when we used to have fair dealings? Now we're just sort of used to everybody. I mean, every nation. is It's actually stunning. I guess what Trump really actually did was pull the Band-Aid off the wound and expose the corruption at every level of government inside the United States. He's not hes not the only one he's as corrupt. I mean, who's an evil abuser? It's all the people around him. I mean, who are the people that devise the cages to stuff children into? It's beyond comprehension. Or to whisk them away to sell them on the sex trade. I mean, you know, someone's made some money selling those missing kids and children. It's beyond comprehension. I'm going to read another poem, you guys. Here it is, number 48. Life on its way returns into a mist. Its quickness is its quietness again. Existence of this world of things and men renews their never-ending needing to exist. So do we have a never-ending needing to exist? I don't know. I guess I just I I don't know how many of you have ever had a family member die of cancer and you watch them slip away their bodies become bloated uh, my sister in less than a month has lost the use of her arms her legs her body she's laying in bed just drifting in and out of sleep and wondering when she's gonna die she literally asked me when am I gonna know I'm dead <laughs> And I said, well, you're probably going to wake up, feel really great, look at your body and think that you look really awesome and feel good, and then you're talking to me and you, I won't be able to hear you. So that's probably how you're going to know you're dead. <laughs> and I actually do blame the nuclear power facility near her for giving her that cancer, to be honest. I think that that is... I am so, as I've said many times already... The nuclear denial is an affront, in my view, to humanity. For us to have these poisons in our midst and to just flatly deny they cause any harm is another crime against humanity that they have perpetrated. It's one thing to set these poisons off on us and force us to deal with them in a way that we have no idea. We're not even prepared. We don't even live in a country where your medical bills will get paid. So we're forced to go bankrupt to deal with poisons that have been thrust on us by the capitalists who view us literally as assets on a balance sheet. Hang on, I need to cough. I'll be right back. So, sorry for that. I think the question, though, really, that is intrinsic on all of us, it's sitting on my heart all the time, though. How do we, what do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? Or do we just live our lives the best that we can until we don't live anymore and try to stay out of the line of fire? Because there's definitely going to be some fire going on. 
I don't know if any of you have ever been a Baha'i, but uh, the prophecy of Baha'u'llah literally kind of explained that there is going to be big massive fires on the west coast. And in my view, when he described it, it was, when I look back on it, it's about a nuclear bomb hitting somewhere and hitting a nuclear power facility or some type of a nuclear facility because the fire that he describes just goes on unimaginably and reaches into the sky. This was a prophecy Baha'u'llah had while he was sitting in prison for over 40 years in Iran for, you know, Baha'u'llah is a, but the Baha'i faith is kind of an offshoot of the Muslim faith, but not really because it accepts all faiths and all prophecies. And for that heresy, Baha'u'llah was thrown into jail for over 40 years until his death. He wrote a lot of things from jail. And this vision about Los Angeles, the West Coast going up in flames was one of them. It stuck in my head. I I did follow Baha'i, the Baha'i religion, like 20 years ago. And recently that uh, prophecy sort of came into my head because it seems like it could be a reality, to be honest. It could be something... Now, the good news is that Baha'u'llah actually does believe in the value of the United States and our commitment to uh, openness and freedom and all humanity. So, I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting faith if any of you ever follow the Baha'i religion. It's, it's not a bad religion. If you're looking for one, if you're out there looking for a religion, the Baha'i religion is not a bad one because you can kind of do whatever you want to do with it. And, it's a pretty kind religion. It's nonviolent. They don't believe in war, which is a good good place to start. That's what I think. I personally gave up on all of the whole religion thing. I think that it is a, a way to control men, women, and children. So let's look at this other article. Nuclear power is clean if you ignore all the waste. That was written on January 4th, 2020. Wow. <clears throat> so it says... The story was originally published at the High Country News and appears as part of the Climate Death Collaboration, and it was written by Jonathan Thompson. Nuclear power generates electricity without emitting greenhouse gases or other air pollutants. Yet it hasn't been extensively deployed to fight climate change because of safety fears, the high cost of construction, and perhaps more importantly, the hazardous waste or spent fuel reactors produce. Now, as the climate crisis worsens, pro-nuclear groups are speaking out. One such group, Atomic Generation Atomic, argues that nuclear power doesn't really have a waste problem. All 88,000 tons of waste or so produced by reactors in the U.S. could fit in a single football field, just as we've heard this many times. Stacked just 24 feet high, it says with the waste produced by an individual's lifetime con energy consumption fitting in one soda can. Compare that to the 100 million tons of solid waste about a five-mile-high pile on a football field that U.S. coal-fired power plants kick out each year. These figures are accurate, but incomplete. They leave out several steps that precede the power generation phase each of which produces sizable quantities of hazardous and radioactive waste. By omitting these, the risk, we risk ignoring the bulk of the nuclear industry's human and environmental toll. The following diagram, and I don't know if I'll be able to explain it, quantifies the waste that is produced from mining to power generation from a year of power production, enough for about 2.44 million households at a plant the size of Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station in Arizona. The Palo Verde Generating Station in Arizona is the largest nuclear power facility built in the United States. It would take about 1.7 billion soda cans or a football field stacked 850 feet high to contain one year's waste. Palo Verde Generating Station generates 31,000 gigawatts of power each year. This requires about 86 tons of uranium oxide enriched to 3 to 5 percent uranium 235 in order to produce that. Oh my gosh, there is, you need to start with an extraction. You need mines 300 and 323,824 
tons of ore. They have conventional iron. Then you have to have nine, 912.1 tons of uranium uh, hexafluoride for producing 43.6 tons of solid waste and 4,800 cubical meters of liquid waste. Each one must be milled. I mean, this goes on, and then you have the enrichment, and you have the fuel fabrication. Then we're talking about the water. 24 billion gallons of water per year is used to process this. This is, is, is beyond comprehension. So in order for the coal burning plant to produce 31,000 gigawatts per the same year, this is what you need to do. So basically you get 15.24 million tons of coal mined, and then you have to burn 44.8 million tons of carbon dioxide, and then the water, how much water is used. Like nuclear power, coal pop, coal power uses large quantities of water, but it, oh, it's 9 billion gallons per year. Wow. See what I'm saying here, folks? Damned if we do, damned if we don't. I, I think that we need to learn how to make our candles again and start using candlelight and go to bed at a decent time and have limited internet access. I mean, I don't know. I guess the people with all the money will have access to everything all the time anyways. What is the answer? Like, this is the weird part. We're living in this weird time where we can see it coming. It's kind of like, I don't know how, I mean, I'll, I'll just share with you my experience as a child. I grew up in a household that was excessively violent. My dad would come home in a bad mood, and he'd pick on one of his eight kids. Typically never me. I was like one of his favorite kids that he liked, but... You know, between him and my mother, there was a lot of violence in our household. And we'd just come home and wonder, wonder when the axe was going to drop. I'm sure there's millions of other Americans that went through this same experience. That seemed to be the way that men expressed themselves in those days. I'm, I'm 64, so this happened, what, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And uh, that's kind of where we're at right now in the world. We're sort of waiting for the bomb to drop. We're waiting for something catastrophic. I, I don't know about you, but I wake up every day wondering what the idiot in the White House, the traitor in the White House has done today to destroy our civilization, which is what they are doing. He's literally undermining every agency in our government. We don't have the EPA protecting our... What little bit that we had of protecting our water and our soil and our air... The EPA has been cut off at its knees. You know, there's no more housing programs to help people in need to get housing. They're going after Medicaid. In fact, this week, that's their plan. They're going to cut off Medicaid and Social Security. They're going to... This is the Alan Greenspan plan. This is what they did to South America. In South America, the United States CIA overthrew every democratically elected official who had plans to not give all of its profits to the United States, but to keep its profit and build up its own country. So now they are doing it to us. This is why they hired Betsy DeVos, who actually takes advantage of students and rips people off. I mean, every level of government is, is, is filthy. Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, who has slid under the, under the wire it actually sits on the board of the bank of, what's it called, the Bank of Cyprus, where all the filthy money, the drug money and the prostitution money gets filtered through to go into Russia. So these people are really, really, I guess we're seeing the head of the monster now and we're having to live through it, so I don't know. I guess we will live through it. Some of us will and some of us won't. So here's the last little story. I know I only have about 10 minutes left, but I really wanted to get to this. Efforts to lock Canford's radioactive waste in glass faces, faces more delays. So why does it face more delays? Uh, feds aim to push back at opening the glassification plant, while state officials say the Department of Energy has been underfunding the cleanup of America's poison site. This permission was originally published by Crosscut and is republished here by permission. And this is reading from High Country News. 
and this is written by John Stang, November 20th, 2019. I hope I can get through it. It's not very long. Already 12 years behind schedule, a project at the Hanford Nuclear Complex meant to transform millions of gallons of radioactive waste into benign glass faces yet another delay. Since the 1990s, Washington State has been prodding the U.S. Department of Energy to build two glassification plants at Hanford that would permanently contain the, the waste stored in aging tanks at the site. Delays have added to the cost of the project, now estimated at $17 billion, $17 billion, and we don't have enough money to pay for health care. Glassification was supposed to begin in 2007. On the current schedule, low-level radioactive waste wouldn't be entombed in glass cylinders until 2023. And the high-level radioactive waste at present, classification of that waste is set to begin in 2036, 29 years behind the original deadline. The Department of Energy wants to push that target back even further and last month began negotiations with state leaders to do so. Those negotiations are expected to address whether additional tanks must be built to hold the waste a move that state supports, but which the DOE has been reluctant to adopt. We want to try to come up with a schedule that doesn't have to be revised every few years, says Suzanne Dahl, Section Manager for Tank Waste Management at the State Department of Ecology. The State Department of Ecology is in Washington. <clears throat> That's what they call their Department of Energy in Washington. Dahl noted that the longer the project takes, the more it will cost the federal government. That's the point, isn't it? Located dead center at the 584 square mile Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Hear that, folks? 584 square miles of a Hanford Nuclear Reservation. The most radiologically and chemically polluted spot in the Western Hemisphere. The site's 177 underground tanks hold 56 million gallons of radioactive fluids, sludges, and chunks mixtures of roughly a hundred different substances. And that includes their old tools. Hanford's 149 single shell tanks are all beyond their design lines and at least 67 have leaked. 67 out of 149. More than 1 million gallons of waste have seeped into the ground in the plume extending towards the Columbia River seven miles away. Some of the leaked waste has even reached the river. Some? It's in the river. The site has also had 28 newer, safer double shell tanks, which are now at the end of their design lives. The inner shell has leaked in one of the double shell tanks, rendering it useless. Since the mid-1990s, Hanford's master plan has been to build a facility to mix and melt the waste with glass flakes to encase the radioactive substances in huge glass logs capable of holding the radiation for 10,000 years. The basic concept was to create a pretreatment plant to separate highly radioactive waste from less radioactive or low-level activity waste. A classification plant would be built for each stream. Roughly one-third of Hanford's radioactive waste can be tackled in low-activity waste facility, Dahl said. Another third is encased in salt cakes, which must be dissolved before the waste can be processed at the low activity waste plant. A final third is just too radioactive and must wait until the high level waste plant is up and running. Construction of the gasification complex began in 2002. The cost of the project has increased from $4 billion in 2000 to about $17 billion today. The Department of Ecology and Energy Department have anticipated new delays in the high-level waste classification facility. In late 2017, the Department of Energy told the state it had concerns about the plant's costs and design risks, hinting startup at the low-activity plant could be 2024 instead of 2023. However, Dahl and Alex Smith of the Department of Ecology Nuclear Program Manager recently said in an interview that the state expects the low-level activity waste plant to open in 2023. In May, Maya Ballon, director of the Department of Ecology, wrote to Ann White, who, re who resigned a few days later after the Department of Energy's Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management. 
No way. I didn't know she retired. Bellon expressed concerns that the Department of Energy could miss key deadlines. The federal department had agreed to have the main pretreatment plant running by 2033, and the high-level waste treatment plant could be ready by 2036. In September, it told the state it has concerns about meeting those deadlines. Wow, this is unbelievable. This is a long article, and I am just going to give you guys the link. But this is... It, it's, it's actually shocking. You know, this lady, Ann White, she's the lady who, who wrote all of the legislation that basically uh, said, she wrote the executive order for President Trump to reclassify the nuclear waste from high level to low level waste. And she also worked, she was uh, an intrinsic person who worked for the person, uh, the company that is going to get this low level waste. So, you know, these organizations, they're all sort of filthy. They, they, the one, one of the sites where the low-level waste is going gave Rick Perry a million dollars to help him become governor. And the other site where the low-level waste, the high-level waste now classified as low-level, uh, that organization gave Donald Trump $326,000. So I guess that's where we're at, folks. I see we're at the end of the hour. I really want to thank you for joining me. You have been listening to Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. And as I always tell you, put your courage feet on because we definitely need it. We are literally, it really will require all of us to actively engage and decide that this is important enough. I personally do not want to see all of my grandchildren dying of cancer. Hopefully we'll be able to stop these monsters from killing us all so put your courage feet on you guys I want to thank all of you for listening this is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show I want to thank Real Liberty Media for carrying my show I appreciate your patience with me thank you to KEPW uh, 97.3 FMLP in Eugene and Springfield and serving the Springfield area I want to thank you for carrying my show and uh, put your courage feet on and we will talk to you guys soon take care Thank you for joining the Age of Fission radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. Thank you for being part of the solution.